Okay, so I think we're now live. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our weekly uh, um, discussion points uh, on Facebook uh, Live with myself, the Member of Parliament for Brighton, Kemp Town, uh, and uh, Peacehaven. Now, we've been doing these for a few weeks, picking up on topical issues, but really the issue that's, I guess, hit the headlines and has hit my inbox uh, the most, people feel desperately passionate uh, about this issue is uh, Black Lives Matters and, the, and we've seen the protest particularly after George Floyd uh, was murdered um, you know in uh, the US and I think in my perspective is that this is of course not the first time that this has happened in the US it's not the first time that we've had protests um, uh, and of course things like this have happened in the UK as well you know kind of deaths in police custody continue to happen uh, in Britain. But the particular, this particular instance has caught people's uh, emotions. I think it has come at a time when we have felt that the world maybe is not going in the right direction, particularly um, we've seen the impact of Bain communities with COVID and that report that came out. And I suspect a number of these things have come together to, uh, to create a breaking point maybe is the wrong word, a tipping point, because to some extent, it's rather fantastic that uh, what we're seeing is this real um, uh, uh, kind of emancipation of people feeling that they can no longer keep quiet and they must stand up and speak out. And I know that I went on a number of the protests uh, with a mask some of the time I had and uh, socially distanced, of course, you never got to say these things, otherwise you get condemned by someone um, but I went on those protests and most of the time actually I was standing on the side applauding the young people and predominantly young black but you know kind of young people from all different uh, ethnicities who were marching and who were passionate and I felt it wasn't necessarily my role to march but to celebrate and support them and I, I stayed until very late on the first night uh, just making sure that they were okay and there were a few scuffles with the police but broadly on the first day of it, it, it went very well in London. But you know, you're not here just to talk, talk and listen to me and we've got two fantastic people that I want to introduce. Um, my good friend Belle who is the MP for Streatham um, and uh, uh, has been a long campaigner uh, on this. I've known uh, Belle for a number of years and particularly some of the stuff that you were doing as a student and, and beyond has, has really focused on uh, uh, making sure that we uh, abolish kind of racial inequality and, and fight for um, black people and I really you know kind of uh, I, I continue to be inspired by some of the work that, that you have done uh, and, and do Belle and uh, Erin James who is the founder and editor of Tough Cookie uh, magazine as well. So Two people you who've been involved in some of these discussions, not just this week, but ongoing. And I hope that you uh, potentially can give uh, your thoughts as well. Look, everyone who's listening, if you put your comments, thoughts and questions, more importantly, what you want us to focus on in this discussion in the Facebook um, comments below, we will get round to trying to answer as many as we can in the next 45 minutes or so as we go on. I've got a few already that have come in about um, what we can do at the local level, what we can do at schools, and particularly what we can do to celebrate um, uh, businesses that are run uh, by Bain people here in Brighton and Hove. But before we go to those questions, I wonder, Belle, if you could talk to us a bit about uh, what you have seen in the last uh, week or so, and how this um, Kind of matches the, the wider movement over a number of years that we've seen in terms of kind of uh, hurt and but peaks and troughs and, and, and successes that we've had. Well, I would say that it's, it's been amazing to see so many young people out in particular protesting, some people that haven't been out before um, and really engaging with what's what's happened now we know this was all sparked by a george floyd um that yet another black man dying in police custody as has often happened in the us and here and we had seen protests like this before obviously it, it's because it keeps happening um over uh, has and has done over a number of years but there's something different about this at the beginning there was the concern that 
you know, it'd be, it would be another upsurge. Um, people would, would protest as they would and things would eventually die down. But this has been persistent. And it's been persistent to the extent that institutions have had to wake up and listen. Uh, and at first you might have thought, everybody's just feeling the need to jump on the bandwagon, but we are seeing some real and fundamental changes being made. Not only that, we, we are seeing an establishment that appears too scared not to listen. And then, you know, that's, that's got nothing to do with, with protesters. We'll come, we'll come on to that later and, and the way in which they're being described, which I think is quite unfair. But, you know, we, we've, seen, we've seen a real change in attitudes. We've seen for the first time, and obviously black people have been in Britain for hundreds of years and black people have been in Britain in, in these numbers and, and growing. Since, since the Windrush generation. But this is, is the first time where we, we're even addressing um, our, our history in that way. We're addressing some of the monuments we have to, to slave traders and what that means. We're, we're properly addressing um, issues with black history and or, or more importantly, the lack of it. And so that, that's that been very inspirational to see. And I, you know, again, as I said, at first we were worried that not that it was it was, it was a, f a flash in a pan type of thing, but you know we have seen this protest before. But I'm just I'm just really really emboldened by the fact that it's it, it's leading to change and that people are having these discussions and not just black people. That I think is the most important thing. We don't have a situation. Where, well, we usually have a situation. I would say where when this happens, you see you, you you'll see the white 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 people who um, on the more liberal side wringing their hands saying, "Gosh, this is really bad." but not necessarily thinking themselves they have to do anything to change it. What I would say about this protest is there's been a lot of consciousness around it. A lot of people who are, are not black are coming forward and saying, what do I need to do? What do I need to do a to be a better anti-racist? Um, do I have unconscious bias? Let me learn more about this history that people are talking about that we were not taught in school. So it's, it, it's been an all over, let's say, re regeneration of, 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 of anti-racist movement. And I'm really, really pleased uh, that we're here. And I, I'm really, really hoping that people don't let up, especially when we've got so much momentum. Oh. I share your thoughts uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 about that. We must make sure that we don't let up um, on momentum in terms of in terms of some of this. And I think that uh, particularly, you know, I'm I'm a white man, and and actually being able to say what do I need to do more to help is also an important thing to be able to do because it can sometimes be that you you get very um, some people have got very uh, in the past kind of defensive. Well, I'm not a racist. I'm not you know actually understanding that we do all have some of those biases and, and we need to do things and we need to take the lead from um, particularly as we're seeing at the moment young uh, uh, black people who are really starting to stand up but m many people uh, in this country who are affected by racism day in and day out. Erin what have you kind of experienced um, in terms of in the last few weeks about uh, these particularly young people who really feel, um, who, who I really feel have taken the lead in a lot of these demonstrations. I, I thought it was noticeable, mm. I don't know if you did, that particularly the first few demonstrations, they were not the usual suspects, as it were, and they mm. were not just the usual banners from yeah. the usual organisations. I mean, they have been there as well, which have been great, but it was a real outpouring of kind of, from, from the very kind of bottom, uh, of, of people's emotions rather than you know kind of organizing that sense that, that seemed quite positive to me but how, how have you experienced that? Um, I do agree with you definitely I feel like um, we can definitely see not only physically in the numbers of the people that are showing up for the protest but along with like the social media movement that's happening and even the messages that we're getting personally in our inboxes as black people um, just how much momentum this um, particular movement has got um, and I do think it's great. I guess it's like a double edged sword because while I see all of the progress that's happening, it also reminds me of all of the times that a lot of other black men and black people have died and people haven't really seemed to have cared enough or at least not to my standards, you know. So it's really been I think it's been great to see the turnout and it's great to see, um, you know, I went to the Brighton protest um, and really just felt like 
there was a lot more people there than I was expecting to be and like you said a lot of young people as well and I feel like there's been this shift as Belle kind of mentioned um, from people kind of calling out racism to actually looking within themselves for racism which I think is like the key point of this movement is that people are sort of white people are kind of understanding and being able to get rid of this sort of initial white defense when you know you, you hear about racism or you might feel like a, a black person is maybe attacking you on racism and remove that sort of that first instinct and be able to actually look within themselves or around themselves within their family and their friends and feel comfortable enough to admit where they've been wrong before in the past and to call themselves out and to call others out um I think it's been great. Um, I feel like there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of things that we could be doing better. Um, but I'm proud to be from this generation. Um, I know that for me, it feels like this is, you know, there's been a few signs on social media. It's like, this is the generation that is really not gonna take any, any more of that. You know, we're really actually, we're done. And I feel like there's a lot of people that have been fighting before us to make this happen. And they're, they're still here and they're still fighting. And we're now here to aid them and to, and to help them spread their message. Well, why do you think it is that there's that feeling of we're done, we need to, you know, kind of, we, we're done with keeping quiet, we're going to uh, yeah. stand up and say something now. And why is that different now than in other times when we've, we've seen yeah. this? Is it, is it just a social media thing that we're able to be more connected now? Or is there something more fundamental in terms of an economic injustice that is kind of more acute or, uh, or, or, or or some other kind of strands that are coming through? Well, it's difficult because I think it is a combination of, of a couple of things. Um, it's hard to say why it's taken this particular killing of George Floyd to really spark such a big movement. I can only really speak from my personal experience. And for me, it just feels like that is enough enough is enough we are tired we are exhausted and we are seeing this far too often and I feel like there's really just been this sense of for whatever reason it's I don't know if it's been spontaneous I don't know if it's chance I don't know if it's progression um but there's just really been the sense of actually no we're not going to let this up we're going to carry on speaking about this and we're not going to make this a trend that lasts a week we're really going to carry on and we're really going to um push hard on this I also do feel like because we're in such a weird moment in, in our society and in our lives where everyone's sort of in a very different routine to how they'd usually be, having a lot of time for reflection, having a lot of time alone or at home, there has been a chance for people to not be distracted by other things and carry on with their daily life and carry on with their own problems. Essentially, you know, people have been reduced to a very simple lifestyle um, because of COVID-19. So I feel like perhaps that has actually aided the movement in giving people this chance to breathe to sit with these feelings, to, to sit with the movement and think about why they need to get involved and why this needs to last, you know, beyond a hashtag. Mm. I mean, Belle, do you have any thoughts about kind of, uh, about this in terms of, are there kind of wider things that are going on that make people feel that this is a moment that we really need to um, do more than just make it a hashtag, as it were? I think it's it's been a pilot Mm -hmm. um as it is it's in a pylon of issues we've seen um a, a, over the past few years and obviously that's not discounting everything that's happened in the years before a situation where we are we do have more access to information and as we have more access to information um via social media uh, and, and 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 such we are also seeing it just the continuation of systemic racism so in this particular in this country you know, stops and search and deaths in custody have continued. Meanwhile, we've seen the issue with the Windrush crisis. Meanwhile, we see a continuation of the hostile environment, but, you know, going beyond the Windrush crisis. And then on top of that, we have austerity, which has really massively impacted mm -hmm. um, the BAME community. And then we get to this, this space uh, of, of COVID-19. And, and definitely it's been um, you know, out, out, of, out of our normal routines, but also it's been the excessive deaths of, 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 of black people from COVID-19. So I think all of those coming together um, and, and getting to a point, as you said, we're, we're, just, we're just not going to take it anymore. Every single part of society seems to play unfairly against our communities in a situation where we can see that things could be better, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, 
and and you know attitudes of the past uh, and and that's not saying that people didn't didn't fight against injustice before but i feel like in a, in a society where things are institutionally racist as black people you can in some ways accept what the situation is you know you work hard for what you want but accept this inequality what the difference is now with all of these things pardon people are saying we're not accepting it anymore we know that things can change if you know we we solve the matters of institutional racism um, and we're, we're just not going to take it anymore so it's it's piling on um being being better educated about structures and i, I think again through sharing things on social media and being better informed about what's happening i think there are a lot of things that people didn't know before and they would have their own experience now they've got everybody's experience and piling that all onto yourself makes you feel a certain weight mm -hmm. that you just can't carry anymore and i think the protests are all about shaking it off yeah yeah there's something kind of um cathartic about going out there on the streets and feeling that rather than that oppression being just on you yourself by sharing it with others you're able to also feel that um, you you can be part of your own liberation, I, I suspect, and I think that's true in, in lots of different forums. I think there's also something that struck me the other day. I always think of myself as very young. <laughs> 30, so do I, Lloyd. 30. So do I. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm in I'm in my mid thirties. Let's put it like that. You know, I'm an eighties an eighties born 80s child. Eighties baby, yeah. Yeah, and and really, I grew up in my formative years. You know, kind of just after a lot of, you know kind of when I was really at secondary school just after Stephen Lawrence and just after a lot of that stuff yeah the Labour government and there was a feeling that things were getting better and that actually you just needed to hold on a bit because things were going in the right direction and now I think that there's something a lot of young people that have that have come of age that you saw in those protests they're 10 15 sometimes years younger than than, 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 than myself and the feeling is very different. Instead, their formative years have been with two, you know, with an economic crisis, with kind of, you know, uh, if, if they're a bit older, with kind of foreign wars that were hugely unpopular, a feeling that things actually haven't really improved. And in some areas, things have kind of gone backwards or deliberately been stopped. And so I think that there is also that, that anger that wasn't there in the same way 10, 15 years ago, because there was that feeling that things would get better if we just kept going. And now a feeling that if we don't do something, things will actually get worse. And you see that then in the US with Trump, but also Bolsonaro, his treatment of ethnic minorities yeah. in, um, in Brazil. And then you see, of course, in the UK, a prime minister that thinks it's okay to use all these racist mm -hmm. terms, you know, letterboxes, watermelons, and all that kind of awful stuff that you have. And actually, our leaders also are are, are complicit in this. So mm. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll move on to some questions. Unless there's, do you want to come in on that, Erin? I just kind of wanted to to just kind of make a comment on what you said there, and sort of why I think that the younger generation, you know, just speaking from our experiences, why we feel so angry and why we feel the way we do, and why perhaps we're seeing more change happen at a quicker rate now. And I do feel like that's because. Um, we've sort of grown up where we have already accepted less than previous generations have mm -hmm. as the normal. So growing up, it was like, there was already these changes being made to society in terms of trying to um, work on racism, institutional and structural. So there's already a sort of bar that's been set there for me personally. I see that as I've grown up, I've seen society around me trying to work to change that. And then sort of recently seen that just not being met at all. And I also feel like um, there is definitely a, a lack of trust in the government right now. I feel like they've definitely shown that, um, especially with like the corona situation. And I feel like this lack of trust is definitely a big um, reason as to why a lot of people are speaking out now and really getting angry and also really not being afraid to get angry. Because I feel like previously to this, I would not have been calling out a lot of racism um, that I've experienced for fear of white people not understanding or not getting it. Um, and I now feel like I'm able to. And I think it's quite interesting to see that actually now I feel like it's valid that I can call out racism, whereas before I found that difficult, you know? So yeah, it's just a point. Yeah, that's very, that's, that's very interesting, the changing kind of perspectives of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Look, I've got Ned here has emailed um, uh, um, and put in uh, and uh, said, 
schools are important uh, as we know our formative years are the most important in our personal development. A lot of black people I know, including myself, experience racism in school, some prejudice from school educators as well as direct racism from students. Is there anything that could happen on the local level or, you know, I guess also the national level to sensitize young people at school to these issues affecting ethnic minorities in this country and worldwide? Could that be delivered by BAME people in the Brighton community? Is something like this happening already? So, I mean, there are a few different parts of this question. One is, how do we change the school curriculum? But the interesting part I thought to this question also was, who delivers mm. the school uh, curriculum so it's not just you know kind of your stuffy history teacher who you know kind of uh, specializes in world war one and two um and, and the whitewashing of world war one and two of course let's, let's remember brighton was the home of the uh, of, of, of the indian regiment but very rarely is it ever talked about and it's you know kind of uh, in the same with many other you know kind of the East Africa Regiment and others all fought in, in, in those wars, but very rarely talked about. But that idea that it's not just about the same stuffy teachers, but actually BAME people themselves helping deliver some of that education. Uh, there was, some, well, there was, we in our manifesto at the last election, um, that we didn't win unfortunately, although you fantastically joined us in parliament, but we had a lot of this stuff in there, didn't we talk about uh, um, curriculum reform, um, getting to you know uh, talk about some of the atrocities of the empire and the British Empire a bit more openly all of that was in there um, do you think that that will go somewhere now do you think that there's there's this kind of uh, momentum to ensure that we get curriculum reform uh, I think uh, w with the protests and actually um, again with the, with, the, with the controversial nature of the statue one thing that people have been crying out for is is more education mm -hmm. because People didn't know who Edward Colston was before. I mean, there are so many different slave traders and people walk past the statues, see them everywhere, and they don't necessarily know what they represent. And I think it's shocking that a lot of people didn't or don't understand um, that slavery and colonialism made our country what it is, specifically what it is. And I think the fact that we don't learn that in schools um, is an issue. And I know there's been a lot more conversation about teaching. I mean, I, I asked the, um, the leader of the house today if we put down a debate about it in parliament so that we could talk about, you know, properly teaching people these these things in our school schools. And I always say that um, an anti-racist education system is important because nobody's actually born racist. A baby's come into this world and they know no different. Everything we do and all the behaviours we we put out are all because we learned them. And if we learn them, there are, there should definitely be a situation in our schools where we're working to unlearn them. The only way we're going to um, you know change uh, this is systemic um, injustice and and that particularly with racism, is to have a very open conversation in, in, in our schools, within our curriculum. And that's not just one part or for one day or even for one month. And in that one month, you're lucky if you have one week. And when you do, sometimes you're learning about American black history, which is fine. But we have our own history here in the UK, our own civil rights struggle. And I think it's important that we learn about that. If we don't understand um, how our country came to be will never move forward in a way that's that's inclusive and in a way that um, you know respects all of our community so it definitely it's definitely something that people are calling out for we're calling out for it in, in, in parliament and hopefully um, you know we can work towards a, cur a curriculum that that reflects what this country is yeah I mean I mean if you I mean I suspect you feel that similar that the curriculum is is deficient in this area but in terms of about who delivers the curriculum is that something that you know I mean I know our particularly in Brighton here that the reality is our teaching workforce is incredibly white mm -hmm. compared to um, uh, compared to other areas and so actually understanding that the people delivering it also might need educating themselves and might need also ability for for children 
and students to see different people in, in those responsibilities? Mm -hmm. Well, this is the thing. I think that's something that's really been overlooked. Um, I just wanted to say as well that I completely agree that um, like across the teaching industry and within Brighton, it's very white, but I would extend that to Brighton as a whole, actually. I would just say Brighton in general is, you know, is very white and therefore makes it, you know, a bit more difficult to get our voices heard. Um, growing up in Brighton and having education like in Brighton, I think this was very apparent. And it was also very apparent um, that my history teacher was quite ashamed, I think, of, of slavery and Britain's dark roots and therefore kind of skirted over the subject a lot. Um, and I learned nothing about it, really. I didn't even know myself as a person of colour about the country that I was born in and its sort of roots and its treatment of my ancestors until I was a teenager because of lack of education. And I think that's quite, that says it all really. Um, and I feel like in terms of who's delivering it, I think it is very important to hear directly from black people and black voices. I think that's definitely needed, but I'm also just aware that the, the black community and the black voices, we are the ones that are the most tired and we are exhausted. And I feel like it's also very important to make sure that we are supporting the black community um, and people of color by taking some of that weight actually off them and making it, make white people making it their responsibility to educate themselves and to learn themselves, to take a little bit of that pressure off and to know that you don't, even though I think it would be good to have black people teaching black history, that that shouldn't be necessary for it to be taught correctly. I think it should be across the board, like regardless of your race, it needs to be, you need to have that education. Um, and I feel like it's just really, really not there at the moment. I think you put it well, just there where you said um, your teachers were almost ashamed of the, of the history, and it is a shameful history, but that is particularly difficult. If It's not a malicious thing that they badly have taught some of those things, but it's, a, it's, it, it's an inability for many people to, to have come to terms with some of the awful atrocities that Britain, this country that to some extent speaks in our name because we Oh, I am a representative of, of, of uh, and so is Bell, you know, kind of in, a, in the British Parliament, you know, so, so to some extent we, we hold that um, what, what, what the corporate Britain has done in the past is partly our responsibility and, and I think a lot of people find it very difficult to talk about it with I any... Do. And I think I do, un I do understand yeah. that feeling of shamefulness, but I, and I think it's a very British thing as well to kind of, you know, don't ask, don't see, don't tell type of thing. But I just feel like it's it's beyond that now. And yeah. we have to kind of take, we have to understand and white people have to understand that they are gonna feel uncomfortable in this process of educating themselves. Mm -hmm. That is part of the process and that's what's needed to be to be done. Yeah. No, I, even I, some black people, I think, feel <laughs> uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, go, <laughs> go on, Bell, Bell, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. No, even some black people feel uncomfortable about um, about talking talking about slavery and being being talked about in their, the context of the history of coming from slaves because obviously to be a slave is 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 completely dehumanizing and undignified. In this situation where you know you're just trying to get on and do your thing, um, you know some people haven't wanted to talk about it, talk about it. I know a friend of mine ran a youth group and she was talking to some young people a few years ago, and they were saying, well, why why do we have to talk about slavery like that's it's not nice like what well, why what why do we have to know about that and she was she was really um confused about why she understood why why elder people behave but she was confused about why younger people thought it was just something they didn't want to know about because it was because it was horrible because it was bad and because it happened to people that look like them mm -hmm. but I, I i suppose until we address that that shame we're never really going to move past it yeah but it's, it's just like when any, anyone does something wrong, you go through these different levels of emotion, don't you? You know, kind of personal trauma puts you through different emotions. And, and we, I guess, as a collective, need to just move to the next stage of that emotion, which is accepting um, what, what's happened and, and starting to try and get it right. Look, I've got another question here that I think um, is important. Um, this is one from Pretty Patel. Uh, not from Pretty Patel, about Pretty Patel. <laughs> if only she was uh, uh, listening, we could teach her a thing or two, I'm sure. It says, Pretty Patel called Black Lives protesters thugs. 
and Tommy Robertson has started stirring up hate. Uh, how worried should we be about the reaction from the right, both the Tory party and organisations like the EDL, and how do we counter that? I mean, we saw some of these, you know, kind of football hooligans surrounding statues and monuments in the last few days in different parts of the country. Um, I think it's a, it's a good question from my perspective, but it's not an easy one necessarily to answer because we mustn't then suddenly hide just because we're afraid of Patel or the EDL, you know, kind of you need to um, make sure, but we need to also ensure that we don't engage in some thing that will spark them off and give them the upper hand because they are unpleasant, very unpleasant groups of people. Uh, I mean, well, you've been involved in organisations like United Against Fascism and, and, and others for a very long time. So I guess there's, there's a long history of how we counter some of these people, but particularly, um, you know, you've got, a, we've talked about a lot of young black people on these protests that are potentially very vulnerable if you, um, if you have these kinds of thugs uh, trying to clash with them. Is there ways that we can ensure that we counter them without um, exacerbating them or do we just need to front it out? I mean, it's always right to be safe. I think it's really, really important that people, um, especially if you're protest protesting, as far as I'm concerned, on the right side of history, are also on the right side of how you're protesting. And that means peacefully protesting. And, you know, sometimes people who are peacefully protesting, unfortunately, have things done to them which, which are completely unfair. But it's important that, you, you know, you take that stance and do it and do it peacefully and don't react to some of the horrible things that are coming and I would always say and I, this has been my experience with uh, anti-racist protesting and, and this is even when you know you've had various groups the BMP the EDL the um, they've always got new names different groups of fascists uh, whenever they've come out there's always many many more of us than there are of them and and that that should definitely embolden you, make you feel a bit safer when you're when you're out. Um, but but no, I think I think you should just hold fast to the fact that there's definitely more of us than there are of them. Always protest peacefully, and um, so don't put yourself into situations where you, you you're at risk. A lot of the times on these on these protests, people will be shouting some awful awful things, looking for you to react, um, and and just don't do it. Yeah. Quite, quite, quite right. I mean, there could be an argument. You just, just ignore. We just ignore and we plough on, and we know that we're in the right side of history and going to, going to get there. And they're there to try and distract us, to try and deliberately, you know, kind of provoke us into, into these distractions. Uh, and we've been quite lucky, I think, so far in the Brighton protest that we haven't had the kind of right really trying to hijack it. But let us remember that most of the fundraising of the National Front came from Hove and that's where the National Front's headquarters were for many many years um, you know so Brighton is not immune to um, EDL marches and, and others coming coming down here and we have to constantly be vigilant a bit about it don't we? Yeah and I think that's um, I want to draw on that point a little bit there just because I think um, what you said displays quite a, a shared um, mindset and idea about what Brighton is and what Brighton looks like, which is that it is quite a peaceful, you know, open and diverse place. Um, obviously, I didn't, I, you know, I think they were very peaceful protests that have been going on so far in Brighton. Um, but I don't want to give that to be kind of suggestive of or reflective of the Brighton and Sussex police, because I've had really, really bad experiences with the Sussex and Brighton police, and I know that a lot of people have. So I kind of, part of the work that I want to do, especially now, um, and with like the whole sort of the UK. We're just losing you, I think, uh, Erin. And that was actually quite an important point there about how we engage with the police, because uh, Sussex police, like most police forces, are not immune. And there are a number of deaths that were either not properly investigated um, or have been exacerbated by Sussex police action in the last 30 odd years. Um, and it is particularly important that we uh, have that discussion. Uh, we, 
Bill, we have seen in some areas really, really good, you know, kind of, uh, I mean, I know in Brighton, some of the police stood outside the police station and we'll, we'll, we'll try and get Erin back um, and went on their knees and we've seen fire fighters do that. I mean, that's important, but there is a danger that then it's kind of a whitewashing of, oh, well, they're all okay, it's fine, we don't need to think about some of the institutional reforms that desperately need to happen with some of those institutions. How do we get that balance, you know, how do, how do we react to that when there are good people, clearly, in those organisations who are wanting to show support and solidarity, but the organisation still has some underlying issues and problems? Well, I think um, if, if, if the people are really good, they'll understand that themselves. <laughs> and it's important that we put pressure on them um, to, to realise it. And obviously, there, there, there are definitely you know, police forces in, at this moment in time that are, are sh showing sensitivity to the situation. And actually, I would point to the Bristol police. The Bristol police, when the statue was being taken down, I mean, what, the first thing I thought when I was watching it, I was like, wow, where, where are the police? Um, but when I heard one of the, the, the lead officers uh, speaking, gave an interview, and he said, look, you know, we are, we are a community police force. We very much understand who this statue is and what this statue means to um, black people, particularly in Bristol, and what an issue of contention it is. We saw what they were doing. Um, obviously, we were watching for safety reasons. We uh, were taking a very certain approach to policing this demonstration because of the matter that it was on. We saw it was happening. Nobody was harmed. And we thought to make sure that no one was harmed, we, we allowed it to happen. And, and one of them actually said, could you imagine the image of police officers stopping people from tearing down a slave trader's statue during a Black Lives Matter march. He's like, no, nobody would want to see that image. So we saw what was happening and we allowed it to happen. And that is that is police, a police force understanding um, the situation. But I would hope that also police force like that would understand that there was much more to learn. Yeah, I think that uh, that interview from Bristol Police seemed to uh, be fantastic in the way that they expressed that I thought it was expressed very well and that decision was clearly uh, the right decision it was very disappointing then hear Pretty Patel in the Commons afterwards saying it was disgraceful and disgusting using words that was focusing far more on look I, I'm no fan of statues being uh, torn down without going through the proper authorities and I suspect the case to tearing other statues down in that way doesn't exist now, but sometimes you need to kind of break the dam, you know what I mean? You need to kind of mm -hmm. do the initial action. I don't think you should necessarily do repeat that action everywhere, but the initial action has been done now and to spend our time condemning it or whatever seemed totally counterproductive in, 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 in the comments. But actually there's danger there that in Pretty Patel condemning it, some police forces then go, oh, well, Bristol did the wrong thing. We need to clamp down on it a, a bit more. Look, I, we've got Erin back and you were making a good point there. Yeah, around, <laughs> uh, we, we've kind of, we, we're talking broadly on, you know, institutions and, 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 and the police, because you had picked that up, you know, kind of that you can have individuals in those institutions that try and do the very best things, but the institution itself still has a long way to go. And you were talking about your desire to work with Sussex Police and the and the Brighton uh, commanders and district, uh, the Brighton district particularly. Not to work with them, but to but yeah. more raise awareness on yes on the issues that black people and people of colour face with the Sussex Police. Um, and the statistic that I was just um, reading, it was uh, to finish it off, between 2018 and 2019, black people were 11 times more likely to be stopped and searched than white people. Mm -hmm. That is higher than the national average in the country. The national average is 8%. So Sussex are actually doing worse than the rest of the country. And when you think about that in terms of this label of Brighton being narrative and, you know, Sussex being, um, Brighton being diverse and uh, Sussex being quite diverse I think that really dismantles it and it's just quite a good quite a good statistic to just show what I'm talking about um, and yeah I just kind of feel like with everything that's going on with the protest um, it's definitely great to see this um, whole sort of rhetoric of the UK is not innocent being really established and people really 
um, mm -hmm. having time for that idea and doing some research into into why the UK is not innocent and why there is problems problems here. Um, and yeah, I kind of you know my parents moved me down to Brighton because they were under the impression that it was going to be like a safer place for them to live. Um, my family is white and I guess they were kind of right in that sense but growing up a mixed race coming from a white family it was very difficult to sort of navigate this experience of growing up in Brighton in a very white space and feeling like oh I'm in the UK I don't have anything to worry about with police um, and kind of having that sort of crushed um, I got stopped once it was snowing and I was just painting like finger painting um, on the cars in the snow and the police pulled me over and they threatened to arrest me for vandalism um and they said that if i didn't want it to be arrested that i needed to move on very very quickly and there was another time where i was at a beach party the police came for whatever reason i guess to shut it down i was thrown to the floor for no reason uh, my black friend was pepper sprayed there's been a lot of examples of institutional racism around me and it's like I'm very glad that this movement has really taken off and I'm very glad that the UK is being included. And I guess I feel my role now is to really speak out um, as a black person who's experienced a lot of racism in Brighton um, about what has happened to me in order to, not to shame people, but just to educate them a little bit and, and, and help them notice it a bit more around them. Yeah, it, 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 I think there is this awareness, um, which is really important about the UK ongoing issue and issues of racism and it can exist in our institutions and our police but it all can it also can exist in local councils you have the best local councillors and the local council staff can be really on board but you have just decision making processes that make it very difficult to be able to actually work out um a system that is not racist you know kind of the the, the structure is set up i i, I had a case a few years ago of a woman who was complaining about race, low level, but ongoing racist abuse in her council flat with her neighbours. And the council kept saying, well, unless she's got a police report and there's enough to show that they've been violent against her, there's nothing we're going to do. And it kept going on until the woman felt unsafe to live there, ended up living, uh, moving into um, kind of in, 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 into a tent in fact, she said she felt safer there. And then the council said, oh, well, you've not lived in your council house now for six months. You've disqualified yourself from your council house. You don't need that anymore. And you've made yourself intentionally homeless, so we can't help you. This is a woman now who is um, still in the homeless support system. It ends up, it ends up being absolutely counterproductive for, for, for the council. But that woman actually was reporting a legitimate concern, but because it didn't meet the priorities and the thresholds mm. of what the council policy was, because they said, oh, well, normal people would have no problem with going to the police and they can make a police report without understanding that there are some other issues that maybe mean that people don't feel comfortable about reporting to the police. And when they do, the police don't always pick up some of these issues in a, in a sensitive way. We, we help. We, we tried to intervene and help at the later stages of that, but by the time our office got involved, it was you know already months down the line and these things had already happened. But so that's just one example of where it's not just the police, but other institutions like the council as well that have uh, have these issues. And we know uh, that it's uh, that it's ongoing. Look, we're, we're, the time is ticking. Um, I've got uh, another question here, which is around, um, uh, look, I'll, I'll read it out and, and then we'll answer it and then we'll probably wrap up if that's okay. Um, during this time, since the killing of uh, George Floyd and through the protests and the reaction here, um, an organization in Brighton has uh, put up black businesses on Instagram. Looking at this, I feel very positive, the person says. This should be celebrated and it should be encouraged. Is there something that can be done at a wider level to support this? Could there be a festival or some activities post lockdown to celebrate uh, BAME businesses um, and, uh, and other activities uh, and contribution of BAME people here in Brighton and in the UK? Um, and the person's linked to the Instagram account particularly uh, in that instance. What's your feeling? How do we kind of, there's, there's protest and there's reform, but there's also celebration which is important and, and are there things that you think, Belle, maybe that we can do um, 
post lockdown to ensure that uh, people who have made really positive contributions to our society. We had a lovely event last night, didn't we? Um, I don't know. Yeah, uh, we did. Which was celebrating Diane Abbott's 33rd year in Parliament, the first uh, black woman ever elected in the cohort of the first group of uh, people who were the first BAME four people ever elected in to the British Parliament. Um, and she's still still going strong. So there is an important role of celebration. John Mack at that suggested that we put a statue of Diane up, which actually there are a few pints spare in Parliament. I, there's, one, there's one just opposite Margaret Thatcher that I thought might be a, a good balance. But you know, on this more serious note, there is an importance of celebrating the real pioneering work that different people have done that we need to, that we need to do as well. No, definitely. I, I, I completely agree. And, and I completely with the, agree with the constituent that put down um, that that comment about celebrating. I mean, the way I see Black History Month is it should have it should really be a, a celebration of different things. It shouldn't be a time where we we learn about our history. That history should be throughout the curriculum, whereas the month should be a celebration. If, if, if you get if you get what I mean. So maybe when we hopefully get to this place where we have an equal education system in terms of learning. Oh, Belle, we've just, you're... Sorry, yeah, somebody just called me. I'm using my phone. <laughs> okay. Um, in, and maybe when we have that situation where we have an equal, a more equal education system that's putting black history across um, everything and across the whole year and building the, um, building, in sorry they've now messaged me just threw me off um, building uh, building the uh, building in our history of slavery and colonialism and structural racism and talking about that maybe that's once that's built into our curriculum then we can look at where black history month is more of a celebration and less a history month and i know that different councils and, and different areas can do can do different things um, i know some some councils will even have let's say a taste of event where all of the restaurants get together and they're having uh, you know, all of the, the different foods from Brighton, Kemp Town. And I never knew about the last name in the name of your constituents, <laughs> which like I've Kemp, now forgot. Kemp Town um, so Peace Haven. That's it, Peace Haven. I never remember Peace Haven. Peace, or I never Peace, Haven, Peace Haven's not in the city. So it's a town on the edge of, on the, edge of the city. But it originally it was called New Anzac which Anzac okay. was the Australian, New Zealand and uh, Canadian forces. But after Churchill sent them to their death in Gallipoli, they decided to rename the, rename the town. Of course, another crime that Churchill had committed. But we'll talk about Churchill's <laughs> crimes, which are long and many. He did do some good things, of course, um, but uh, later, late, late, later on. Uh, look, I, I think you're right that, that this celebrate the celebration of Black History Month should be a celebration because we should be doing the heavy lifting, as it were, the rest of the year and the rest of the time around. It shouldn't just be, uh, um, you know, kind of you do do the difficult stuff once a year and, 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 and the other way around. Erin, uh, do you have a, a, a view a bit about how we, particularly here in Brighton, you know, I always feel you've got the kind of um, uh, the, the Black and Asian minority centre just by the train station, but it's all kind of hidden away. It's not very public for those who wouldn't wouldn't know. Um, yeah. And there's there's a, there is a need for more celebration and visibility in Brighton uh, locally. Mm -hmm. um, I would definitely say that um, it would be great to see more funding accessible to um, places like the BME YCP that you just mentioned. I used to go there. Um, unfortunately, I believe that it did lose a lot of its funding um, and they had to start scaling down their programs that they were able to offer to people. Um, that group, um, that sort of institution for myself and a lot of my other uh, minority friends was like make or break for us understanding and loving our identity. To be able to have, you know, a group of black friends around you in Brighton, especially growing up in Brighton is a very powerful thing. And um, for me, it certainly meant the difference between me, like being able to really accept and love who I am as a black woman. So I feel like places like that are really important. 
Um, I also feel like there's definitely could be something happening in terms of organizing my housemate. Um, she's been talking about putting on a festival um, sort of like interlinking all of like the black nights that go on in Brighton and stuff like that. I think the best thing that people could do um, is within their own homes, have a look at where they're spending their money. Um, take one, just one day out of the week where you don't go and spend any money in anywhere that's sort of like, you know, co-op, Tesco, big corporations and actively research and look for the black businesses around you in Brighton because there are loads of them. There are so many of them and they're all around us. There's supermarkets, um, there's barber shops, there's pubs, there's restaurants. There's so many places. So I feel like people can really reinvest um, back into black economy and help support black people in Brighton. Um, I also just feel like it's very important for uh, black and minority people right now to be feeling like they have something to celebrate. So being having sort of spaces where we can see our allies supporting us and, and you're giving us a safe space to celebrate our culture with us, I think is going to be very healing to the trauma that we've had to deal with, not only all our lives, but especially within the last few weeks. No, I, I agree. And making sure that we celebrate the different different aspects of um, the BAME community as well. And I know it's something that the guys at the, at the Marlborough pub have been trying to work on for a number of years around pride because pride in um pride in uh, brighton uh, and actually in lots of places had been very white male uh, focused and there was a real keenness to ensure that we celebrated uh black and vain queer artists and um uh, and the contribution of the of, of the black community to lgbt struggles which brighton generally is good on um but uh, is not good on understanding some of that intersectionality uh, mm -hmm. part of it you know kind of we, we're good on thinking we're all for gay liberation um but actually understanding there are multiple levels of that and so actually making sure that we take some of that that is just a few days every year and actually expand that as well rather than it just being a few days on the side of pride around the corner in a nice little pub but you know kind of not the centerpiece and maybe we need to maybe we need to start making these things the centerpiece of what we do here in Brighton. And I suspect that's how we need to think about things uh, also on the national level, not just, as you mentioned, Belle, a, a Bain History Month on the side of, or an extra little bit on the curriculum, but the centerpiece needs to be proper equality. Look, we're almost at our time. Is there anything else that either of you want to quickly say before we wrap up and say thank you? Um, no, this has been a really good chat. <laughs> good. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming along. It's a, it's hopefully, it's a moment for us to talk about something every week. People mm. can comment along and re-listen to it as well um, yeah. on Facebook Live. And it will be subtitled uh, later on on YouTube. We've had a number of uh, uh, comments from uh, Hamilton Lodge, which is the, the, the deaf school, asking us to um, get a signer or um, have subtitles. I'm afraid getting a signer to do it live is, is just prohibitive for our costs. Um, if there is someone from Hamilton Lodge that wants to offer, I'm sure that we will be willing to, but what we are going to do is make sure all of the backlogs of these discussions and this one as well, the day after will be put on uh, YouTube with subtitles so you'll be able to read it. So we hope that that will, will help uh, ensure uh, that. Um, thank you both of you coming uh, along and having this conversation. I really appreciate it. And to everyone else, have a good night. Continue to keep safe, keep your family safe during this moment of crisis. And I hope that we will see you again next week. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. See you soon.